Today, we're going to look at an idea that, honestly, it kind of messes with your head. It suggests that our whole picture of ancient Britain, the very map we imagine in our minds, is just wrong. So let's get into it. I mean, listen to that. That picture is a lie. That's the core argument we're digging into today. The idea that the landscape we think of as timeless, the shape of the land itself, is anything but. It's a challenge to everything we assume about this place. And that really is the question, isn't it? If the geography is wrong, what does that mean for the people? For their incredible monuments, their epic journeys? If you change the map, you have to change the story. Okay, so the first thing you have to wrap your head around is this. The Britain we know as an island is actually super recent. Our familiar map is only about 8,000 years old. Before that, Britain was just the northwestern edge of Europe. So any story older than that isn't an island story. It's a mainland story. And you know, that shift from a peninsula to an island, it wasn't peaceful. At the end of the last ice age, this whole area was a world of pure, violent chaos. We're talking about melting ice sheets, surging seas, and rivers swelling to sizes that are just almost impossible for us to imagine. It was total transformation. And this timeline just shows you how incredibly fast it all happened. The ice age ends and boom, meltwater starts pouring in. The lands becomes this thick, nearly impassable mess of forest and swamp. Then a massive flood just carves out the Isle of Wight in what was basically a geological instant. And then finally, around 6,000 BCE, that last connection to Europe is gone. An island is born. And get a load of this number. 60 meters. That's how much the sea level rose. To put that in perspective, that's like a 20-story building. And the source here is emphatic. This wasn't some slow, gentle creep over centuries. Huge pulses of meltwater could literally drown entire landscapes in a person's lifetime, maybe even in just a few years. Of course, the most famous victim of all that rising water was Doggerland. And we have to stop thinking of it as just a land bridge. It wasn't. It was a real inhabited country, a massive, sprawling landscape of rivers and hills, twice the size of modern-day Wales, where thousands of people lived for generations. And then, it was gone. The drowning of Doggerland was a catastrophe on an unimaginable scale. Suddenly, people who were once connected by land were separated by a huge, dangerous sea. And this, according to the theory, is what changed everything. Suddenly, boats weren't just handy. They were absolutely essential for survival, for connecting with people, for trade. This new, watery world changes how we see everything, even the River Thames. Forget the river you see today. The prehistoric Thames was a seven-kilometer-wide monster, a vast, braided tidal delta. You didn't try to cross it. You couldn't. You used it. It was the M1 motorway of the ancient world the main highway for getting anywhere or moving anything. So, if we take this new, radically different, wetter map of Britain, what happens when we use it to look again at those famous monuments our ancestors built? Well, this is where it gets really fun, because it starts to solve some very old mysteries. Let's start with the big one, Stonehenge. For ages, the great mystery has been the blue stones. How on earth did they get them over 200 kilometers all the way from the Presley Hills in Wales? The traditional theory is all about brute force, right? Hundreds of people dragging these massive stones on sledges and rollers through dense forest and soggy swampland. It sounds awful. But this new perspective offers a much more elegant answer. Why fight your way through the landscape? when you can use the landscape. The theory is that this was a brilliant piece of engineering, using that network of huge, swollen rivers as highways to float the stones most of the way. Not brute force, but brains. And this water-centric idea goes even further. It completely reimagines what Stonehenge was even for. Think about it. The site stood on a peninsula right next to the River Avon. It had its own natural spring, and we know the famous bluestones have antibacterial properties. So the theory is that the spring water flowed past these special stones, creating a kind of medicine. This reframes Stonehenge from just a temple into something much more practical, a prehistoric healing center, a place you went for survival. And it's not just Stonehenge. This way of thinking changes how we look at other sites too. All over Britain, you see these huge earthworks we've always called hill forts. We just assume they were for defense. 
But what if the name itself has been misleading us all this time? Because when we use modern tech, like LiDAR, we see something surprising. A lot of these so-called forts aren't even on high, defensible hills. They're down in wet, low-lying areas. And those massive ditches? They weren't just empty trenches. They were moats, filled with water. So, they weren't isolated forts. They were more like moated trading posts, built in the perfect spot to control traffic on those watery superhighways. So when you put it all together, you start to see a completely different ancient Britain. You see, if you change the map, you have to change the story. The entire logic of where people lived, how they traveled, and why they built these incredible things, it all starts to shift. And that's the heart of the whole idea. It's called the post-glacial flooding hypothesis. And all it really says is that our old view of prehistory is broken because we've been using the wrong map. To get our ancestors, we first have to see the world they actually lived in, a world absolutely defined and dominated by water. And that is the single most important takeaway here. We look at a river or a channel and see a barrier, an obstacle to get across. For them, living in a world of tangled forests and treacherous bogs, water was the exact opposite. It was the connection. It was the fastest, easiest, safest way to travel, to trade, to move anything. It was their infrastructure. And this final quote, I think, just sums it up perfectly. It's not just about drawing new lines on a map. It's about seeing a completely new past. It changes our view of our ancestors from, you know, primitive people dragging rocks to sophisticated navigators and engineers who understood their world and used it brilliantly. So that leaves us with one last big question. If we could be so wrong about something as basic as the shape of the country, what else have we gotten wrong about our ancestors? What other incredible stories are just waiting for us if we only learn how to look? Thanks for watching.